Hello, and welcome to the Sustaining Soils podcast brought to you by Valent Biosciences. I'm your host, Lisa Peterson, and this is episode three, Uncovering the Soil Microbiome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I am really excited for you to be introduced to our guest for this episode, Dr. April McIntyre. April earned her PhD in microbiology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she focused her PhD on bacterial wilt diseases in tomatoes. After her PhD, she remained at the university as a postdoctoral researcher. And in her role there, she isolated and characterized environmental microbes to create synthetic communities. For those non-researchers like myself, she helped find microbes that optimize nitrogen fixation for corn and sorghum. April recently joined Valent Biosciences as a soil microbiologist. So in her role, she leads the isolation, characterization, and evaluation of plant growth promoting rhizobacteria, or PGPRs. She'll also be responsible for the design of laboratory and greenhouse experiments to evaluate PGPRs and AMF mixtures for their enhancements of plant growth and their impact on soil health. Welcome, April. We're so glad to have you with us. Thanks, Lisa. I'm happy to be here. As you just heard, April has a real depth of scientific knowledge around this topic, but don't let that scare you. My goal today, as we have this conversation with April, is to make the soil microbiome more relatable and understandable for those of us like me that don't have a PhD behind our names. So let's go ahead and get started. April, let's start with a foundation and just talk about what is the basic soil microbiome. Okay, that's like the easiest question. I got that one. Um, So the soil microbiome is all the um, microbes that live in bulk soil and around the roots of plants. And that includes uh, bacteria, archaea, which are basically kind of fancier bacteria, fungi, protists, which are single-celled organisms, um, oomycetes, which are also considered or called water molds, um, and also viruses, A lot of times when people think of the microbiome, they think of plant pathogens initially because they get a lot more press than the symbiotic microbes get. Um, But there's a lot more symbiotic and commensal organisms, meaning microbes that don't really do anything one way or the other, than there are pathogens out there. It's a really diverse mix. You know, I think we hear a lot right now about the soil microbiome, and it's become more of in the soil rhizosphere, and it's become more more buzzwords. So as people are learning more about the soil microbiome and the rhizosphere, why is it important? How is that impacting us as growers right now? When I look at a pile of dirt, or like the soil rather, I should say, I'm always like, what's what's in there? What's alive? Because it's a lot more alive than people, I think, realize. And it does, it does a ton of stuff for um, people, for health, um, and for the environment. For me, there's like five things that it primarily does. Um, the biggest one is nutrient cycling. And then the microbiome also contributes to crop protection, um, greenhouse gas reduction, plant growth promotion, and also just generally soil health. I really want to focus a lot on the nutrient cycling because as a farmer, as a producer, understanding how that works in our soil makes has a direct impact on our crops and the productivity of our crops. So let's t- start with nutrient cycling. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's actually one of the biggest points I wanted to get across is that basically nothing moves in the soil without microbial assistance. So the, the big three that I want to talk about are nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon. And microbes play a huge role in the cycling of all three of these nutrients. So I'm personally a huge fan of nitrogen. If I had to like describe myself at a party, because I'm a nerd, I'd be like, I love nitrogen physiology and bacteria. So the nitrogen cycle is basically the cyclical recycling of nitrogen gas from the atmosphere all the way back to nitrogen gas. And um, what microbes do to get nitrogen gas out of the atmosphere is they they fix it with an enzyme called nitrogenase. And that turns um, nitrogen gas into ammonia, which is if you grow soybeans, um, you'll know that those root nodules, that's exactly that process that's going on there is nitrogen fixation. And it's 
part of the reason why soybeans and other legumes are so exciting is because they don't necessarily need their own nitrogen fertilizer. They, they have ba bacterial friends that do it for them. But in addition, to, in addition to nitrogen fixation, you've got the process of nitrification, which turns ammonia into nitrate, which can be good for some plants, but is primarily a problem when you're worried about nitrate leaching out of your field. In addition to nitrification, there's a process called denitrification, which turns that nitrate all the way back into nitrogen gas. And that's also important for agriculture because that's the main driver of nitrous oxide emissions from, from fields. And that's also entirely bacterial mediated. So you've got nitrogen fixation, nitrification, and denitrification. And that's, those are all performed by microbes in the soil. April, great explanation on nitrogen cycling. Now, what about phosphorus? Again, this is not super well known, but uh, phosphorus is not biologically accessible to plants without the help of microbes. Uh, most of the phosphorus that's present in soil is um, mineralized, where it sticks onto soil particles, basically turns into a rock, and the plants, plants can't do much about that. So what bacteria do is they solubilize mineral phosphorus in the soil, and then that phosphorus then becomes biologically available for symbiotic fungi to take up and transfer um, to plant partners in exchange for carbon. And uh, if people have heard of arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which uh, I think Lisa mentioned earlier as a AMF, these are uh, incredibly symbiotic fungal organisms that are present in, I think, about 80 to 90 percent of land plants. Corn particularly loves um, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, but this fungus can serve up to 100 percent of the plant's phosphorus needs and is just a big, a big way to transfer this nutrients from the soil to the plant. All right, now let's do our final one, carbon. For carbon cycling, microbes are, are biomass. So anything that goes into a microbial body as carbon stays in, stays in the soil and is an efficient sink for carbon from the air. We've talked about this on past podcast episodes, but arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi are particularly good at sequestering fixed carbon from plants in their um, hyphae and also in fungal proteins and sugars that survive for long periods of time in the soil as um, aggregates, essentially fungal glue that, that keeps uh, soil particles together. And in addition to uh, like nitrogen and phosphorus and, and carbon cycling, uh, my microbes are responsible for decomposing complex materials in the soil, which frees up nutrients for plant, other plant and microbial use. April, I love how you explain each one of those pieces of the nutrient cycling. And earlier, you also mentioned that the microbiome is important in other aspects as well as the nutrient cycling. So can you quickly cover some of those as well? I think you mentioned crop protection and greenhouse gas reduction, um, as well as soil health. Yeah, absolutely. So for the microbiome is important for crop protection. Um, it's actually a pretty, it's, it's pretty easy to understand where basically like the healthier and more complex and diverse your soils are, the more they provide disease resistance. And the reason for that is if you just, if you have a very diverse community of microbes and they're all using the nutrients that are present there and they're all metabolizing at full speed and they're established on plants and they're established in that soil, it's gonna be a lot harder for a pathogen to invade and suddenly disrupt that whole ecosystem. And I think we've been talking, you know, you think about our last two podcasts too, we've really focused on that soil health piece. And, and I think folks and producers and farmers and growers as well are all starting to look at soil health a lot more and paying attention to that and how um, the soil interacts with all the other things that we're doing as far as crop protection and fertility. So I, I think you make just such a great point there of you know, we're recognizing we've got to have a more diverse and healthier soil than, and to pay attention to the microbial activity in the soil. Yeah, absolutely. April, anything else that we miss in discussing why the microbiome is important? Like I said earlier, a lot of people tend to focus on um, plant pathogens, but there's a lot of microbes out there, including plant pathogens that, that have um, 
really intricate pathways for interacting with plants. And a lot of these pathways are uh, directly stimulating plant growth. Um, so the microbiome, I would say in general, is really good for, for plant growth promotion. Microbes produce compounds that make plant roots grow. Microbes also produce compounds against other microbes to prevent pathogenesis. So there's some microbes out there that are marketed as biocontrol organisms. Microbes also help plants tolerate heat and salt and uh, cold stress. I don't know if people have heard, but there's a there's a cool grass out in Yellowstone that can only grow in really hot soils, basically because it has a fungal symbiont that lets it tolerate that heat. So that's a really blatant example. Excellent. Well, thank you. April, we just had a lot of discussion on how important the microbiome is. So now my next question is, what can I do to change the microbiome? How can I affect it? Sure. So I can see how the microbiome would seem like this big, immovable object. And like, there's so much diversity and there's nothing you can do to influence it. But actually, it's it's an extremely um, malleable thing. And it changes, it changes throughout the year. It changes depending on the type of soil you have. It changes depending on where you're farming. Um, but if you are stuck to one place and one time and one type of soil, um, if you really want to change your microbiome, there's a couple of different ways to do that. The first is changing crop cultivars. So plants are one of the main drivers of the microbiome in agricultural settings because they select they select microbes with their root exudates. So plants are always releasing carbon into the soil from, from photosynthesis. And in addition to that carbon, um, which will naturally attract microbes, they're also releasing other, other chemical compounds into the soil, which some microbes are, are more interested in than others and can actually also be antimicrobial to some extent. And if you have crops year-round in your soil, um, if you are lucky enough to live in a place that is that warm or you're using uh, cover crops throughout the year, then you're constantly releasing carbon into the soil for microbes to use and you're constantly enriching your soil um, for, for biodiversity and for maximum nutrient output. Another thing you can do to change your microbiome, so the kind of soil that you have is really important, like how much, how much carbon is in the soil, how aerated is it, um, what, how much sand to clay to loam ratio you have, and how often is it tilled. Um, those things will all very dramatically affect the microbiome, as well as your, the climate that you live in. Um, I like this example that I, I, I went to the University of Wisconsin and I lived in Wisconsin for seven years, I guess. And it's a really great state for vegetable production because it's so freaking cold <laughs> that in, in the wintertime, many pathogens that would be present in warmer climates, um, they die. So, and th that really that really affects what you have in your, your, your soil and the microbiome as a whole. Yeah, and, and another thing that can change your microbiome are um, farming practices. So, I mean, this depends on on your needs and what the disease pressure is in the in the place that you're living. But for example, um, we know that fungicide application reduces the diversity of na native fungal communities, and while it's also reducing like pathogen pressure, you just have to think of the trade off between you know how how bad is my pathogen pressure versus how much do I want a, a diverse, like our muscular mycorrhizal fungus community for, for phosphorus uptake, for example. So the less native fun, fungi you have, it lessens the amount of nutrients that plants can access in the soil and increases the reliance on, on chemical farming, which is one of the reasons why we advocate for the use of using um, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi inoculants, um, since current conventional practices for farming, especially in, in corn production, suppress uh, AMF colonization. So does having specific kinds of microorganisms mean that I have a healthy soil? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, it, it depends on the support that your microbes have. I mean, they're just like us. They need, they need their food. They need their shelter to some extent, whatever that means in the soil, whether it's a, a plant root or 
a pocket of oxygen with with a lot of carbon. So if they if they don't have the right conditions, they won't necessarily thrive and perform important ecological services to max capacity. So April, that that helps me, you know, that you say it really depends on what type of support microbes we have as far as if we have the healthy soil or not. So I guess that leads me to the next thought and the next question is, well, then how do we know what we have? Like, how can we identify that um, and know that we have the right microorganisms for what planting practices and, and growing practices that I'm doing? So that this falls under the category of like biological indicators of, of soil health. And I think that there are probably two methods that, that producers and growers might be the most familiar with. So the first is called uh, phospholipid fatty acid analysis, or better known as PFLA. So this is a, an analysis of um, lipids that are that are present in the soil. So every every organism, even multicellular organisms, all cells have a membrane that are made of of lipids, which are essentially just fats. Um, and these cell membranes break down very quickly after um, death. So PFLA is looking at different kinds of lipids in the soil. And, and so it's, a, it's actually an indicator of living microbial biomass, since those lipids don't tend to stick around very long after, after microbial death. So, so this is a good way to quantify the microbial biomass in your soil. And also, um, different microbial organisms have different lipid profiles in their cell membranes, so it can actually give you a breakdown of the of the abundance of bacteria to fungi to protists, um, et cetera. So why is PFLA important? Um, it's another tool that can tell us more about the biology of the soil. But even though it's a good indicator of living microbial biomass, it can identify down to like the species or genus of organism that you have in the soil outside of very broad biological kingdoms. All right, so let's dive into that other technique then, because I'm thinking about how do I make this practical for me as a farmer, right? And what do I need to look at? And, you know, there's just so many different things and we're learning so much that sometimes it can feel a little bit overwhelming of how do you quantify things? I would say generally for, for PFLA, like more microbial mass is probably better. And that's that's probably the most useful thing to take away from from an analysis like that. You know, April, there, it seems like there's just so much here to think about. Is there any other technologies that allow us to measure the soil microbiome? Yes. So the other, an, another technology that I think producers might be becoming more familiar with is microbial barcode identification. Or in, uh, in academic science speak, we call it um, meta-amplicon sequencing. But just, just think of it as like, you know, barcodes that you would scan at the grocery store. So what this technique does is it isolates um, bulk microbial DNA from the soil. So DNA, just like what we have in our cells, that's the blueprint for, for life. Microbes also have that. And what's interesting about bacteria and, and archaea and, and fungal species in the soil is that there are, are parts of um, microbial DNA that are very highly conserved. So they're the same it's, it's present across basically all microbial life, but there are, are pieces of that very conserved region of DNA that are very much not conserved and are essentially different from, from every single species. So it's essentially um, like a, a microbial fingerprint that you can use to tell down to the species level what kind of bacteria or fungus you have in the soil and also their abundance. So it sounds like to me, and correct me if I'm wrong in this, that there's some great technologies that are coming down the line. And I, I assume that those will only continue to get better and we'll get better at understanding the testing and how that information we're given back from the testing, how we can use that to impact. So I, it feels like we're kind of on the cusp of this technology yet. Am, am I right there or or wrong? Do you, is it more advanced than I think it is? No, I think I think you're absolutely right. We um the <laughs> we can we can generate a lot more data at this point than we necessarily have the functional research to back up for for that data so we can make a lot of interesting assumptions about what the soil is doing and we know a lot more than we than we ever have since um 
since sequencing became only became cheap enough to do this within like the last decade. So as people probably know, like academic science, sometimes it can happen very quickly, but a lot of times needs a lot of time to catch up. Um, so yeah, we have a lot more data than we necessarily know what to do with or, or how to um, get, inf- get useful information from at this time. But I, I think it's only a matter of time before we can really start using um, some of this stuff very precisely and, and make it much more helpful for, for growers and producers. That's exciting. I'm excited to see where this space goes in the next five to 10 years. So one of the other things you mentioned, April, and I think I would like to explore a little bit just from, you know, you've come from academia and now you're on the commercial side of things. And so how do you see academia and commercial businesses working together in in this area of the soil microbiome? I, I feel very lucky where in my, in my postdoc, I had an advisor who I thought bridged that gap between academia and industry very well. Um, since he consulted for for multiple companies, and I, I got to see, I got to see what biotech was doing, which was different from my PhD, which was hyper focused. I didn't do any applied research at all during my PhD, versus my my postdoc. I, I was funded for a little while by a biotech company that very much wanted an applied technology. So that was that I was fortunate to be able to see both sides. I think that companies like Valen Biosciences, where I'm working currently, are responsible for and able to do the applied research that is necessary to bridge the gap between academic research and um, farmer and producer knowledge and practices. And I, I think also industry does a really good job of bringing in more diversity and thought and skill set and can theoretically move faster than academia in bringing products and solutions to growers by mixing that research and development and that marketing and regulatory, legal sales and and business administration. Well, as we look to the future, and we talked a little bit about it here earlier, but you know, where do you see this science going? Yeah, so I think I mentioned earlier that there's we can, we can generate a lot of data about um, the what kinds of microbes are in the soil and what they're doing, but I, I definitely think that the research um, to back up the the claims that are put forth by companies like like Pattern and Trace and and Ward Labs, I, I think that research is coming very very quickly, and that's partially that's a joint collaboration between I think academia and also industry, especially since here at Valent we have our own soil health initiative, and that's something that we are very interested in is is how can we use that data and what does that mean for farmers, and that's. That's definitely something we're addressing with our, our long-term um, soil health projects. In addition to connecting function to uh, that data, I think that in the future we're going to see a lot more products that are cons- that are that consist of microbial consortia. So what I mean by that is um, instead of having a microbial inoculant that's like just one strain of bacteria and you just blast your field with that one strain. You have several different strains that, um, because there's a couple of different species in there, they have a better chance of establishing in the field and and persisting and competing with the the native microbiome. And that's something that Valen is definitely interested in, Um, particularly that's partially what I'm working with is, you know, can, can we create microbial inoculants that are combinations of fungi and bacteria, and how does that affect um, soil health versus just adding a fungus to the field? You know, that makes a lot of sense to me in that, you know, the more diversity that you have in the field of organisms that you can add and inoculate to the field, that the better that's going to be based on what, you know, what we've said today and what we've learned today about the microbiome and the importance of the diversity of that. April, what decisions do you think growers like myself will be able to make as a result of this science in 10 years? Farmers and producers will have um, increased knowledge of nutrient deficiencies and the ecological capacities of their fields and how these change over time and what impacts that change the most and how the microbiome can fit into that. I, I think that we have a lot of interesting research now that can tell us a lot, but it's 
we need more. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a very data driven person and I, I like to see, I want to see evidence for every different kind of soil across the U S and like different climates and what microbes are there and what they're doing. And it just, we just need time to, um, to gather that sort of data. What a challenge for you guys as well, because of all the soil different types and climates that you're having to deal with to try to find an inoculant or something that will work across a broad spectrum of production activities. Yeah, I, I see it as job security. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> Most definitely. Um, I think also um, the science that we'll produce in the next decade is um, also going to link into microbial inoculants. I think I think that there will be a lot more options in the next coming years and again, more, more data to back up the efficacy of those options. And that'll, that'll help farmers too. Cause the, I mean, the market for microbial inoculants for years was mostly just, you know, Brady rhizobium and soybean inoculation, but it's, there's a lot more now um, for, for corn and, and for specialty crops than there used to be. And I think that'll go a long way to helping farmers and producers address deficiencies in their soil. Excellent. Well, I think it's exciting to see where this science is going to go and what we're going to be able to do here in the next 10 years. So as we wrap up today, April, anything else that should um, be some key takeaways to our listeners to help make this practical to a producer or a grower? Sure. So I think generally um, healthier soil will support a healthier microbiome and a healthier microbiome and healthier soil will support healthier plants and vice versa. I think I've said this a couple times, but I very strongly believe that microbes are essential to nutrient cycling in the soil and literally nothing moves in the soil without microbial help. And and, in every decision that you make in adding things to your soil, think about how that impacts the microbes and the, the biology of the nutrients that you have in your soil. And also another takeaway is in the the, the, is that the field of biological indicators for soil and crop health is a very new field and the research needs to catch up. But even at, even then, like many of the claims that companies make, make biological sense. And I still think that even though we need more research for some of these tools, um, they can still be used as a valuable tool for deciding what, what to amend your soil with in terms of microbial inoculants and fertilizer. And I would say also farmers and producers probably know best what to do. And, and this is just another thing they can add to their toolkit for, for making those decisions. Thank you, April. And thank you for your time today. You know, you've done a great job of really bridging the practical with the scientific and how, how that crosses and how as producers we can look at our soil microbiome. And I also want to say thanks to our listeners for joining us today and listening into our conversation with Dr. April McIntyre about uncovering the soil microbiome. This has been the Sustaining Soils podcast, which is brought to you by Valent Biosciences. Don't forget to find Valent on Twitter at Valent Biosci, LinkedIn and YouTube at Valent Biosciences, and our website at valentbiosciences.com. Once again, I'm Lisa Peterson. I look forward to having you join us for our next episode. Oh, and don't forget, if you enjoyed this podcast, please give us a five-star rating. It helps us to reach more like-minded individuals like you.